going on, but uh, I went into my office this morning and there was a Snicker bar Whoa. laying on my desk even. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Snickers bar. They, they were one of my wow. downfalls uh, throughout life. I have been totally delivered from them, but I think I'm going to backslide as soon as I get home. So, amen. Okay, I am excited about today. It is a new day. And um, uh, also, it's Kislev 1, according to the Hebrew calendar. Hamay understands that the Hebrew months have different names. And in Hebrew, uh, every number, uh, letter, has a picture, has a meaning, etc. Uh, when we go by, you know, January, February, March, those are all pagan gods, you know. So obviously they all have a name, you know. So, uh, but the Hebrew names uh, carry on a story. So we are at Kislev 1 today. Everybody say Kislev. Kislev. All right. It is, are you ready for this, what it means? Yes. The darkest. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Thanks. <laughs> and Sue said, praise God, we have entered the darkness. <laughs> it, is, it is the darkest month. You see, Hebrew is smart. Hebrew knows that this is going to be what? The darkest month. How I many gets up before dark and you can't get home before dark? I mean, my life, my wife, my life, my wife and my life, uh, she leaves uh, before daylight. And I never see her until af after dark again. I don't know what she looks like in the daylight anymore. <laughs> we'll wait till summer. Yeah, wait till summer. <laughs> so it means the darkest. So we are still getting even darker. But how many knows the... The world is getting darkness. Yes, the darkness will cover the earth, gross darkness to people. So not only are we in a dark month as far as just the natural sunshine, right? right. When we hit the winter solstice or, you know, right around the, the 21st of uh, December, uh, then the days will start getting longer again. How many understands yes, that? Yeah. And however, I believe that uh, just because this is the month of darkness, there's another meaning to Kislev, and it means hope. Now, just a little flicker of light in darkness brings hope. In fact, the darker it gets, the less light you have to actually have to bring hope into darkness. How many's got a little flicker of light going on right now? Then you are a sign in this day. Because whoever you talk to, Reverend Connie was at the mall there uh, yesterday, or he was taking something back. She, met, she takes things back and, and makes money. We have more money today because she went and took something back. I mean, there's ways of prosperity that you know not of, you know. Amen. This is a long intro. I'm sorry. Uh, hope. Everybody say hope. hope. And, uh, and then in that hope, you see, that hope is going to not cause us to be ashamed. Hope maketh not ashamed. And so we're moving into faith. So it really is a new day. Amen? Amen. So I'm excited about that. All right. You know how we always get going here. Are you ready to get started? Yeah. All right, let me, let me hear it real loud. How many brought your Bible? Say this. I can have everything this Bible says I can have. I can be. Look at somebody and say, I'm talking about me. I can be everything this Bible says I can be. Are you ready? I can do. Whoa. I can do everything this Bible says I can do. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the, the kicker. Here's the, here's the thing. Today, I'm going to let this word become life in my life. Amen? All right, turn with me to... Mark chapter 16. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I picked 12. I figured that was a good number. There may be more. 
but uh, I'm not going to necessarily, well, I don't know. Maybe I should read all of them, but uh, I will at least quote them. Mark 16, and uh, Mark 16, and verse 15. The title of my message is, I Can Do Everything. Now, now let me let me before before I get you all scared here, because this is going to be talking about evangelism and oh God no evangelism. <laughs> I was I was going to talk about evangelism, but before I do, I want to uh, mention how many actually has uh, had or I can have. How many has some of the things that the Bible says you can have? I mean, how many has been healed? Yeah. Someone got healed this morning. Yeah. So you have what the Bible says, right? right. How many is prosperous? Yes, sir. I mean, Riley gave his traumatized and offerings, and uh, he was faithful in all that. Other truckers are getting cut, and he moves into a new trucking business. Yeah. Nate, where's Nate at? Oh, sorry. You're right in front of me. Now, and, and Nate, traumatized offerings, Right. People saying, ah, you know, that, you know, that church is about money, you know. However, today, see, those people around him have lost their job. And he got a 14% raise. So I asked him the other day, I says, uh, if you had it to do all over again, would you do the Tarumatithe and offering thing? He said, oh, 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 yeah. That's why I'm here. You see, you can have everything the Bible says you can have. How many is glad that you've... You have some of those things, yes? How many realize that you can be everything the Bible says you can be? I mean, Stephanie Carter, I mean, come on. She can pray circles around all of you. I mean, she just stands up here. She gets right to the throat, kills the devil, glorifies God, and gets the problem solved. Very, very calmly. Very precisely. She can do it. Amen? All right. Today, you can what? Do, just like you can have and be, everything the Bible says. Whisper to somebody and say, I think Bishop's setting me up for this. Okay, verse 15, here it goes. And Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. Yeshua. I can't even get it right. Uh, and he said unto them, I was telling some of the ministers, you know, I says, you know, when you first got saved, you're so used to saying something, you know, you can't even, you can't, you know, you need to say it differently, but you, you just can't because it's so memorized, you know. And I said, you know, like that language you used to have. So when you hit your finger with a hammer, these ungodly words come out of your mouth and you, 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 you weren't even thinking about pronouncing them. You know, it just kind of. Yeshua, Jesus, he said unto them, stay in church and let Reverend Mark preach the gospel to every creature. Is that under signs? <laughs> he said unto them, you just stay in church and let the professionals do it. This is what he said. Go. And do what? Preach. Now, underline that in your Bible because I'm going to emphasize that. It does not say teach a Bible school on the spot. Okay, just, just say. Go and what? Preach. Preach. Where? All the world. Where's, where do you go that's not the world? I mean, this is like an everyday thing then. Because it's pretty hard for you to live in heaven and then just slip back here for service. We all know you're not. Sure. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every. Creature. every. Everybody say every. every. Now, who, who, is, who could that be? Every. My, my goodness, anybody that has eyeballs, arms, fingers, toes, everybody. Toes and it says Creature. I started out years ago, and I, I started with my cows. I preached to them. I said, you are healed in Jesus' name. 
because I'm tired of writing checks to the veterinary. And I said, I can have everything the Bible says. I lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It didn't say sick people. It just said sick. I laid hands on my Buick Riviera one time because it was sick. Aaron will remember this. I mean, it, it wouldn't get out of first gear. It wouldn't shift. We were like 10 hours from home. It's going to be a long ways home in first gear. I mean, I was off the side of the road. You know, but you can't. I pulled over. I laid hands. Did I not? And what happened? For a little while. And then it shifted. And then I smiled. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> no. <clears throat> anyway, I'm just saying, sick. Everybody say sick. sick. You can do this. You don't, uh, in fact, after service, I'm going to give you an evangelism program that even if you're a caveman with only a club and a rock, you can do it. What did Yeshua say? What did Jesus say? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Yes? Yeah. Now here's the key. Some will believe and some won't. That's true. I say some will believe and some won't. He that believes and uh, is, is submersed into what you're saying will be saved. Yeah. And, and they that don't will be what? Damned. damned. Well, they're damned already. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so what, what we have here is a problem, Houston. We have been evangelizing wrong, which is why nobody wants to do it. Yeah. All, right. All right. Here is a dating machine right here. This is called uh, Presenting BAM Building Aggressive Ministries. I hate to tell you how old this is, but if you could see my picture, you would know this is a long time ago. <laughs> okay? And so uh, what we used to do is I, I would have a team of evangelists, and we would go and into other cities and win people to the Lord. We would go and preach the gospel. Yeah. I had written three syllabus. One was... Um, on perspective, notice the quality binding that we had back then. Um, perspective, four classes on perspective, four uh, classes on tools, and four classes on techniques. And we would go in and we would gather some people in a local church. The pastor would have us in. And I would teach all of these classes on a Friday uh, morning, Friday night, Friday afternoon, and Saturday morning. And then my team would come uh, on Saturday afternoon on the Greyhound bus and uh, we would do an outreach and we would, yes, win 20 people of the Lord in that afternoon. Those people would then be in church on that Sunday morning where we preached also. The pastor was very tickled. Amen. So I know what I'm talking about. Are you with me? And the first class that I taught was soul winning, not spirit winning. Yes, sir. Most people try to go witness and try to get somebody born again. You're not God. You can't do that. God said he wanted you to be soul winners. What's your soul? Mind, will, and emotions. What are you supposed to do? Try to change their mind, get to their emotions, and see if you can change their will. If that happens, God can cause a born-again salvation experience. Does that make sense? So I taught people, you don't have to get someone to a, a sobbing prayer on the street. Quit trying to crunch them into the kingdom. Bless God, I'm going to pray with you whether you pray or not. You know, that's not it. You just want to change their mind about something. So we go and do what? Preach. Everybody say preach. preach. All right. Let me read uh, some of these verses. I'm not going to go over them all because the point I want to make is God says you can do this. All right. Matthew 9, 37. 
you might want to jot it down and highlight it in your, in your Bible, but um, it's basically saying the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. It's not that there is not people out there ready to get saved. The problem is there's just not enough laborers going out into that harvest field. Are you with me? 1 Peter 3.15 1 Peter 3.15, it says, be ready to give an answer to every man that has hope. I mean, you, you should have some sort of answer to every man. Now, it qualifies a little bit that has hope. In other words, your testimony should give them hope. And then you should be able to just simply answer a question to every man. Isaiah 6.8, I love this. Isaiah says, who, who will God send? Yes, sir. God says, who, who, who will I send? He says, here I am, send me. I mean, that's as simple as it is. Well, if the, if the harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few, well, then who's God going to send? Well, your response, well, here, send me. And God looks at you and says, you don't know nothing, so you qualify. I'll get to that later. Uh, Romans 1.16, it says this, the gospel is the power of God under salvation. Yes, sir. If they don't hear the gospel, they can't get saved. Yes, it is the power, the authority for salvation. Now, we'll talk about the gospel, but, but the gospel is not the entire New Testament or the entire Old Testament. It is simply just good news. Yes, sir. Good news is the power yes. unto salvation. Minister Riley got up here and said, I've got some good news for you. If you will trust God with your finances, he'll not only get you out of the situation of job situations, he'll bring you into being the head and not the tail. Yes, sir. He'll bring you into a, being a business owner and not just an employee. Yes, sir. That's good news. That could lead unto what? Salvation. Salvation coming to God and their life being changed. Yeah. So what's the gospel? Sometimes we think it's the Romans road to salvation. We go through all these scriptures and we know if they just get all these scriptures, they'll get saved. Yeah. Well, it's possible in the day we're living in, a lot of these people already know those verses. Sure. Up here. And so you're telling them something they already know up here. And they already know up here, well, I, I already read that and nothing happened to me. I'm still broke. I'm still sick. Like Deacon Heath said on the video, what a great guy. You know, I didn't even want to go to church. didn't want anything to do with church. Well, thank you. But then this isn't church as normal. See, he didn't want anything to do with church. He wanted something to do with God, a relationship. Everybody say good news. Yeah, it's the power of God unto salvation. Acts 1.8, you know, the Pentecostal verse here. However, it's probably available to Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Word of Faith, Charismatics also. It's just another verse in the Bible. You shall receive what? Power, power authority, yes, explosiveness. Yes. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall. Run around the church. Shake the bobby pins out of your hair. Holy roll under a pew. Oh, that's extended oh, no, 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 no. That's not exactly it. Now, you might run around the church. I can still run around the church with the best of you. Yes, you can. yes I can. You've seen me. I can't make as many laps as I used to, but I can still run around. Uh, no, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, we'll know if you really have the, the real Holy Spirit because it says here that you'll be a witness. Yes, sir. Everybody say a witness. a witness. In other words, an example or a testimony of, wow, God has actually touched your life. Yes, sir. 2 Timothy 4, 5, it says here, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. I can what? Do. do. Everybody say do. do. It doesn't say what somebody do. It says you do. Do the what? Work. Yeah, it's work. Of a what? 
evangelist. Evangel just means good news. One who brings good news. All you have to do is bring good news to people. That's better than TV5 news. Yes? All right, praise God. Good news. Hmm. Luke 19.10. Yeshua came to do what? Seek and to save that which was lost. So what should we do? Seek and save. Seek and save. What's evangelism? Looking and finding. You won't find if you don't look. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Matthew 28, 28. All power is given unto me. Yeshua says all power, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. You don't have to worry about the devil anymore. Because all power has been given unto me. Yeah. So he says, you go into all the world and you go into all the world. And lo, I'm with you always. Amen. So I can what? Do. Thank you. The cameraman's got it. Anybody online? I can what? Tell me what? Do. You can do everything the Bible says. Sounds like we're supposed to evangelize. All right, then it goes on in 1 Corinthians 1.17. Uh, Paul says here, Christ has sent me to preach the gospel. He sent me to what? Preach, preach the gospel. Hmm. Now, wasn't he an apostle? I mean, didn't he pioneer churches? Wasn't he the big kahuna? Didn't he have a cassock and give Bible school graduation certificates out? Wasn't he shipwrecked, snake bit, shook snakes off? Wasn't he a miracle worker? It's amazing that he uses this phraseology. Christ has sent me to preach the gospel. See, sometimes we get super spiritual and we lose the, the real heart of it. I just got two more. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study, show yourself approved, a workman... Uh, Unto God that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to know all the Greek and Hebrew and all of that. It, study that we're not ashamed that when we're witnessing, that we don't know what we're talking about. All I know is I was blind once. Yes, sir. Amen. And then the last one, Matthew 25. Uh, Reverend Connie did a... Uh, a very convicting job of that scripture last week. Hello? Talk to strangers? I mean, how many of you ever heard that before? You know, well, when did we see you naked and we clothed you? When did we see you hungry and we fed you? And uh, when, when was you a stranger and we took you in? We've been taught as a child, don't talk to strangers. So thus, when we get into the church world as adults, we only talk to us four and no more in this safe setting. Because in the back of our mind, we're still t thinking, don't talk to strangers. What is evangelism? Oh, my goodness, it's talking to strangers. And there's some strange people. But you will get to enjoy it if you understand that you can what? Do Everything the Bible says you can do. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, God wouldn't ask us to do it if he didn't think we could do it. All right. Prophetic word this year is changing the way we do business. Changing the way we do business. How many souls have you won to the Lord this year? Go ahead and write it down. See if you can uh, pull a calculator out if you need. We'll take a moment. How many's reached the number that you have? I'm just giving you time. How, how many's done? You got it counted? How many's all set? <clears throat> how many's really excited about that harvest number that you've accomplished? Not really? Pardon me? How, how about everybody else? No. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, do you have any leads? I mean, do you have any prospects? Do you have any idea who might be somebody? Okay. Well, then how many of those people have you had contact with? Okay, so a couple. I, I know this, that if you have 10 balls, you're only going to get one out of 10 in any marketing, sales, situation whatsoever. So if you only have a couple, it's probably why you don't have any. Because you at least need 10 before you can get one. So you're not going to get a yes until you get at least nine no's. Unless you're really on a flow. It's numbers. Some will, some won't. So what? You got to find the ones that say yes. Are we okay? Now, changing the way we do business. How many's heard the definition of insanity? What is it? It's doing the same thing, expecting different results. So whatever we've been doing in evangelism, how many wants to keep doing it? Okay, I got three no's. How many wants to keep doing it? Tell me, tell me so I can hear it from the front. Okay, be, because I wouldn't want all of you in BAM International to be insane. Praise God. All right, here is the number one thing that has to change if we're going to change the way we do business. Are you ready? This will set you free if you pay attention. The mindset that has to change. I want to write that down, Elder Christie, because she's a note taker. Amanda is typing it on her computer, so is Aaron. Others, like Reverend Bob, is just going to remember it because he has a great memory. But I give everybody time. Here it is. Evangelism versus discipleship. Evangelism and discipleship. Are you ready? I'm going to separate these two pages because over here I have the evangelism type things and over here I have the discipleship type things. So here we go. Evangelism is, are you ready? Preaching. Evangelism is what? Preaching. Okay, let me set this one down. Discipleship is teaching. May the two never happen at the same time. All right, let's go back over to evangelism. Are you ready? Uh, evangelism, preaching is a public setting. Public setting. Where you only have a few minutes. It's at Waldon, Wal Walnut. Walmart. <laughs> yeah. You got a few minutes. Do not teach. What should you do? Preach. And I've been telling you a 10 second testimony. Sharpen it. Sharpen it down to 10 seconds. All right. Teaching. Teaching is not a public setting. Teaching is a classroom setting. You have hours. My wife is a teacher. She has hours. She wished she only had a few seconds with some students. But she does have hours. Everybody say hours. All right. This is not a public setting. This is a private setting. There's only certain people in there. And they're in there for that reason. Well, not everybody's in there for that reason. But, you know, that's the kind of the concept of that. All right? Now, in this closed setting called teaching or discipleship, people have an interest in a certain topic. It starts narrowing it down. This is healing class. This is deliverance class. This is prosperity class. This is sanity class. You know, whatever. This is what am I going to do with my stupid husband class. All right. So there's topics. And in that setting, you've got hours. 
to go through line upon line, precept upon precept, go through all the scriptures so that there's a total and complete full, full foundation on how to let the word become life in your life in that area. That's called discipleship. That's called teaching. If you don't get it today, there's a class next week. Let's try evangelism over here. People are in a hurry. They don't even want to listen to you for 10 seconds. I meet somebody on the street that's ready to hand me a track on something. I, I know how to ignore them. I am a professional ignorer. I do not turn aside and say, I have an hour to stand here on the street and let you tell me what you want to sell me. That's insanity to think that. Yes? All right. Preaching. Good news of what God has done for you. Good news of what God has done for you. Ten seconds. Some good news of what God has done for you. Can you do that in ten seconds? If you can't yet, sharpen it. Now, this is also good news. Good news of what God can do for them. Sure. Yes, sir. So you got 10 seconds. If they're still listening, now give them 10 seconds that God can do the same thing for you. Yes. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Yes, sir. It's just good news. A testimony does not need a long explanation of doctrine. Your testimony is what it is. You can't argue with it. Doctrine, people will argue. If you're evangelizing and you're into an argument doctrinally with somebody, you're, you're in the wrong setting. You've already gotten out of the box. Are you with me? Did Adam have a belly button? Should we celebrate birthdays? Well, John the Baptist lost his head over a birthday party. Any birthday in the Bible has not gone good. I don't know if you want to study it or not. So happy B-Day? I try to stay away from it. It's not good. You know? Who wants to be reminded that you're older anyway? Okay, moving right along. Don't argue about stuff on the street well is Christmas pagan yeah but that's not good news to anybody like Pastor Aaron said my God you took my puppy yeah. <laughs> you know I was planning on being in major debt this year and you telling me I don't have to I'm already getting a pre pre Black Friday Start on it, for crying out loud. I've already got two credit cards charged to the max, all in the name of Jesus is the reason for the season. But that's, that's, that's a classroom setting. That's not good news. <coughs> Are you okay? Here, here's, here's one of the greatest evangelists in the Bible, a blind man. He, didn't, he, didn't, he never saw Jesus. He didn't know what he looked like. He didn't know what he believed. He didn't want to argue doctrine with the Pharisees. He just simply said, look, I don't know. This I do know. I was blind, and hello, you ugly guy. I can now see. <laughs> That's why you're sad you see. Yeah. And it affected the entire religious camp. He spread to the whole region. He wasn't there standing there arguing doctrine. He just said, look, this is what God did for me. I don't care if you believe it or not, but I'm doing good. That's preaching. Are you with me? That's what I'm talking about evangelism. It's just simple. What did God do for you? And tell somebody what God did for you. Now, you're not going to be able to evangelize if God hasn't done anything for you. And God's not going to say, these are my witnesses, you know, the ones that I've never done anything for. He's not interested in sending people out that God hasn't done anything for. He's trying to pull them all back in. All 
I was blind and now I see. Here's the end of the story. There's no argument. It, nothing to say after this. Right? Now, if you want to know how this happened, then follow me to BAM. Well, can we have a Bible study? No, I'm not into that. Bishop does much better at that, that stuff. Are you with me? Because I'll get halfway through it, and I won't even know what the heck I'm talking about, and I won't remember the scripture anyway. But all I know is I got healed. I don't know if 39 stripes had to do with 39 different sources of diseases. I, I, something like that. I don't know. Let him tell you. And I don't think I got healed because he told me all that. He just laid his hand on me, called out a word of knowledge, laid his hand on me, and poof, it was gone. I don't know. Right. If you want to know how this can happen to you, then come to Bam. Evangelism. How long? 10, 20, 30 seconds, a minute. And you're on to the next one. Listen, it'll either be a yes or no. Did you, did you know it can only be a yes or a no? You got a 50-50 shot at them saying yes. You know what if they say no? Well, mission accomplished. Yes, sir. If they say yes, mission accomplished. See, you just took the good news to somebody. That's what he said to do. He didn't tell you to make the decision for them. All right. Don't make it harder than it is. Over here, classroom. Everybody say classroom. classroom. I'm taking more than 10 seconds of your time right now. But then again, you chose to come and sit here. And we are talking about this particular topic today. So I am teaching. Line upon line, precept, precept. Trying to preach a little just to keep those that don't want to be in the class alive. All right, moving right along. Classroom setting. Classes on different topics. Scripture for every line upon line aspect of that. People sign up for the classes that interest them or they have a need for. They're here for a specific purpose. A professional instructor who knows their doctrine inside and out can handle objections, arguments, and the time to explain. I think I've heard every objection over the years that I can possibly think of. I mean, I've had professional pastors explain to me that healing is not for today. And I would say, it's too late. I've been walking in divine health for 37 years, so I, I'm sorry you believe that, but I'm healed. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen deaf ears pop open. I've seen lame people walk. I know you believe that. But I have to go back to this other side over here. All I know is that guy was blind and now he sees. All I know is that guy had a tumor sticking out like this and when I laid my hand on it, it disappeared. All I know is that baby was dead in the hospital and the nurses are trying to chase me out and saying it's going to be a vegetable. All I know is I just somehow had the gift of faith and said the baby will live and not die. They said, no, it's already dead. What do you mean it's not going to die? Do you see the flat line? I said, it'll live and not die. Bleep, 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 bleep. Two years later, I get a card saying the child is borderline genius. Uh, I, do you want to argue doctrine? Uh, wouldn't... Wouldn't you rather just come to the class and learn how it happened? Wouldn't you rather just be interested in it happening to you? And I mean, if you want to argue, that's a no over there. Next. I don't have time. Making sense? But you, you, you don't stand on the street and argue all that. You stick with preaching over there. You tell them, well... If you, if you ever want to know, there's a class over here. Does that make sense? I mean, it frees you up. Now, the average believer cannot do this. You'll fail and you'll feel condemned. If you try to explain all this, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to run out. 
A believer can't do this, especially in a public setting in a few minutes. I know I can't even do that in a public setting in a few minutes. Are you with me? And I know my Bible. I mean, knows I know my Bible. I can't even do it in a few minutes. And all of you should know that too, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so have you tried teaching in a public setting and thinking it was evangelism? Okay. Let me see the hands of those that have tried that. How well did that work out for you? Not very well at all, right. So that mindset has to change right here, right now. Are you good? All right. <clears throat> this mindset will fail every time, even if you're the bishop. Because you can't teach in a public setting when you've got a few minutes. You're going to open up a can of worms that's going to get over everything, and you can't get it back together. Leave the doctrine to the doctor. I do hold a doctorate in theology. I don't mention that very often, but I do. What's, what's it do? Well, it makes a space on my office wall look nice with the, you know, the degree. Now, we need more nurses, not more doctors who don't know their doctor. The nurse meets the immediate needs of the people, which is the most important thing. If someone's sick, they don't need a course on, you know, hermeneutical, homiletical dissertation on the theological understanding of divine healing. They just need somebody to pour in some oil and wine. Listen, the doctor will prescribe the proper treatment and able to do the surgery. Again, surgery is not done in a public setting at Walmart. People must make an appointment, come to the hospital, submit and trust what the doctor says and allow him to do the surgery. Do you see the difference? Now, stop the public surgeries. <laughs> Quit leaving a bloody mess at Walmart. Will you stop it? Unless you're Minister Ryan, where the lady thinks he's fresh. <laughs> I always have a sermon for everybody, and so I'm sure Minister Ryan knows exactly what I'm talking about, and his wife is probably wondering what that means. So that'll get a little discussion online there while we're going on. Stop the public surgery. Simply refer them to the hospital where they can be properly taken care of by our trained staff. Yes? Besides, you probably can't even diagnose the real problem and you'll probably do more harm. I wrote this down. Don't cut off their leg if they only have a muscle spasm. Just pour in some oil and wine, bandage them up and bring them to church. Does that sound good? Just tell them some good news and then say, I know, I know a place in town that's better than the best hospital in town. They don't cut things out. They actually get healed there. That's kind of a better deal, don't you think? All right, so like I say, I started with simple evangelism when I got saved. Now, I'm going to give you some of my one-liners, my 10-second testimonies. Are you okay? This is how I started. It worked. Now, this is what I used in the beginning. This was my favorite one. Are you ready? It's like cocaine, only 10 times better, and you don't come down, and it's free. Wow. Well, that doesn't sound very doctrinally correct. I wasn't talking to doctors. I was talking to potheads and dopers. They totally understood what I meant, and they followed me to church. Again, again yeah, I made them hungry. Made them hungry. Well, Bishop, I don't know. I mean, I, I witness with theological statements. So how many of you won with that? I mean, talk to people in their language. These were the people I knew. 
I knew this is what they talked. <coughs> I told you I prayed for a man with a tumor and watched it shrink. I just tell that story. And they go, well, I don't believe that or oh my God. All right. I prayed for a baby that died in the hospital. I said that. As you can see, when you tell a testimony, there's no, there's no re- place for doctrinal argument. This is a happening. This is a manifestation. This is something that happened. All right. Are we good? Do you have a one-liner? For some of you, maybe this makes sense. Do you have a pickup line? Just has to be an opening, you know. Hi there, you want to buy me a drink? Well, that's different than can I buy you a drink. They've heard that a hundred times, you know. You know, do you want to buy me a drink? Yeah, right. It, it worked. Reverend Connie bought me one. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, my gosh, the Pope is getting a little crooked. Okay, here we go. Listen, this, this thing has to be a real life-changing experience. Don't make it up or be religious. People do not care. How about this one? God met my financial need. The loan went through. God met my financial need. I was approved for welfare. I don't know if you think that's a testimony, but let me clear it up. There's no one in the world that thinks it is, except you. After three surgeries, a brain transplant, God healed me. Tell the doctor that and see what he thinks. No, come on. I mean, it actually has to be supernatural, not something that could happen to anybody how many loans go through I know you think it's a miracle but banks are still into making money I mean they they are trying to work for you not against you whether you know that or not because they are greedy remove the doctrine and the religiosity out of your testimony just In your testimony, take all religious words out of it. Take all doctrine out of it. Now, that sounds scary, doesn't it? But I'm telling you the truth. Take it out. And just fill it with, this is what God did for me. And it's supernatural. Now, here's the key. If nothing has supernatural happened yet, well, there's an altar here to cry on until something does. How many has had God do something supernatural in your life? Well, then quit trying to preach the entire Bible. Just develop what he did into a nice 10-second sharp edge, two-edged, you know what I mean, a knife with two edges on it. Am I helping you? Here's the one other thing now. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. If you tell somebody how much you know, they will immediately start telling you how much they know. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It will turn into a knowledge war. Well, I can top that. I know more about that. Well, I know more about this, and I know more about that. Witnessing has gone long ago. Get to the heart. With all your knowledge, has God ever done anything in your life? Well, I know the Bible. I've read it. Well, has God ever done anything in your life with all that knowledge? Well, I know about all the different religions. Now, this was one guy's first initial is K. I I talked to him until I was done talking to him. He wants to know everything about every God and every religion except the one and the true God. And he wants me to tell him about it. But then I tell him that I already know about that. So I'm not impressed with all your knowledge. The bottom line is, I've been walking to divine health for 37 years. You just had hemorrhoid surgery. How's that working out for you? 
How's your God working for you now, young guy? Yeah. Knowledge. Stop it. It's got to get to the heart. Yeah. Everybody say get to, the get to the heart. Are you sick? Are you broke? Do you have a bad marriage? I don't care what you know about the Bible. If these things aren't working in your life, yeah. it's just knowledge. Yes, sir. How about the knowledge you're sharing? What knowledge are you sharing with somebody? Is it working for you? Stop sharing knowledge that does not work for you. Because they can look at you and say, it ain't working for you. What are you telling me for? I mean, if you're sick, don't tell them about healing. Tell them about something you have working in your life. It's called a personal what? Testimony, not personal knowledge about something. Now, if you really care about somebody else and not care that they know how much you know, let me try it one more time. You hear what I'm saying? If all you care about a person is for them to know how much you know, you will never evangelize. I don't care what people think I know or not. I just get to the heart. Are you with me? Because I actually care about them because this is what I know. They don't have what I have. So I want them to have what I have. How many has gotten healed? Yes, sir. Then all you have to do in evangelism is, I want to I see other people get that. Yes, sir. Because you know how I got it? Free. Yes, yeah. How did I get it? Trust in God. How did I get it? Well, it came to BAM. They actually do it there. Making sense to you? How many's mindset has changed on evangelism so far? Now, like I say, back in, I guess it was 81, Bill Anderson Ministries. This is what we did. And we had results. The main thing we did was remove the fear of evangelism for people. Our, our, our theme was uh, getting inactive labors into the harvest field. Just getting people sitting in church who was afraid to evangelize them, to evangelize, to just simply get into the... Uh, into the field and start evangelizing. Yes, so we taught them different things. Now this is back in 81. <clears throat> we had clowns. We had mime. We had drama. We had concerts. We, we, we handed out tracks. We, we did a ton of different things here. How many knows that clowns is not going to work today? People are afraid of clowns. They are murderers and rapists and child pornographers, you know. So uh, going to the streets as a clown is probably not a good thing. But back then, everybody surrounded a clown. Are you with me? Mime. Mime was powerful for the people because I watched putting on a little white makeup on somebody's shy face turned him into a gorilla. Somehow they hid behind that little layer of makeup and they went to the street and they were dancing and shaking and acting out and everything. You take that makeup off, they couldn't say anything to anybody. Powerful. You know, stick a puppet on somebody's hand and stick it through a hole and they're great at evangelism. But if they stuck their head through it, they wouldn't be able to talk. Different things like this. But that was tools back then. I say that was tools back then. Seasons come and seasons go. This was the season that I started the ministry. We literally won hundreds to thousands of people to the Lord. Put them in other churches. I'm ready to start putting them in this one. Are you with me? Now seasons changed. I started out as an evangelist. It's like cocaine, ten times better. And you don't come down and it's free. I won a lot of people. People came over to my house. Then when I sat down in a classroom setting and said, you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your, your life, people thought, wait a minute, I thought you said it was free. <laughs> oh, this is going to cost me my life. That's more than a $25 bag or something, you know. Not everybody said yes in the classroom. But at least I got them to the place where they could make an intelligent decision. So I started as that, and then we won people to the Lord. This place was full. Uh, this place has probably been full five times. We've had a little shifting going on 
over the years. But we were in a discipleship time. So, uh, remember, you've got, what's over on this side? Evangelism. What is that? How much time? Okay, thank you very much. And then when you win a bunch of people, then you come over to a classroom setting. And it takes, what? Hours. Four years of Bible school and classes and discipline and meetings and meetings and phone calls in the middle of the night. And oh my God, evangelism's fun. Discipleship. Seed, time, harvest. What time is it again? Seed time again. It's time to go back out and plant some more seed. How many's with me? Now, what will happen? Well, we'll fill the place again. We can fill this place in one, uh, one month. If you do what I'm saying. We can fill the place in one month. Then what will we have to do? That discipleship stuff again. But leave it to the doctor. Why don't you just stay out there and have fun? Make sense? Once again, uh, the devil's main focus, I taught on this years ago, the devil's main focus is to stop evangelism, not to stop you from getting your healing. Not to give you a bad day, not to give you a headache. That's not his main focus. His main focus is stop you from evangelism. He thinks it's great if you get together with a Bible study with a bunch of goats in the house someplace. He has no problem with that. He encourages that. Read your Bible, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. But he doesn't want you evangelizing. But this place says I can do everything the Bible says I can do. So how many wants to evangelize? So we just got to get back to, uh, back to evangelism. It's called the Great Commission. Terry Mize used to say it was the only commission. Of course, he's a missionary, so he thinks every scripture is missionaries. Business people think every scripture is a financial scripture. Teachers think every scripture is Greek or Hebrew. Okay, moving right along. I have no idea what page I'm on here. I'm just thinking I just want to quit. How many wants me to quit? How many's in agreement that it's time to quit this thing? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Okay, I'll give you a couple more. Believers do not say no to evangelism. But they do say no to what they'll have to do if they say yes. Believers do not say no to evangelism. If you ask anybody, do you think the church should evangelize? Does everybody believe that? All right. But they do say no to what they will have to do if they say yes, I want to remove that fear. They believe the message, but they don't know how to share it. They can't be like the preacher, so they don't do it at all. The truth is, you will never be like the preacher. You'll never be like the apostle. Nowhere does it say you're supposed to. Well, where does it say you should have to? And, you know, from this perspective, thank you, Lord, I don't have to turn them all into apostles because it hasn't been working. We are members in particular. We all have different gifts. It's okay to be who you are. So I must help you as a believer become activated in evangelism. I want to help you just get doing this. Yes? How many wants me to help you do that? So, what simple tools, techniques, a system can we implement that makes it simple? Right? It's not clowns. It's not mine. It's, it's not those things. I have a new system. Everybody can do evangelism once we understand what it is and what it isn't. How many understands evangelism is 10 seconds? Yes, Everybody say 10 second evangelism. Ten second evangelism. Whew, isn't that better than two, two minutes of pain and arguing and, and failure? 
So that's the number one thing you have to draw the line on. Yes? So what do you have to take evangelizing? <laughs> no. In fact, it'd be best if you left it at home. Then you won't be tempted to take it or use it. You understand what I mean? All you have to take is a testimony in your heart and maybe a phone number or website in your pocket. Something really simple. Oh, and probably your cell phone because, well, obviously you, you wouldn't leave your life at home, which is where everybody lives. Yeah. All right, so what do we have to do today? Overcome. To him that overcomes, to him I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Have you ever understood that overcoming might have to do with the fear of evangelism? Try it one more time. How many is totally convicted that you are the worst evangelism person on the planet? How many is at least? Okay, the first thing is to acknowledge your sin. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice release. I have one no one. I am an idiot. I know not what I'm doing. He that winneth souls is wise. I haven't won any souls, so that must mean he who I am is stupid. All right, that's good. You know what happens when you confess you are missing the mark? He is faithful and just to what? I forgive all of you. Sprinkle some coffee on you or something. And then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Doesn't it feel good? Just feel that right now. Just feel, oh, thank you for forgiving me for being stupid and not evangelizing. It's good news, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to be condemned right now. I see there's still a little condemnation floating around. I just, you know, waiting for the blood to settle all the way through, you know. Amen. All right, we must overcome. Everybody say we must overcome. How do we overcome? Blood of the Lamb, word of our... Oh, there's that testimony thing again. It didn't say the word of our doctrine. We don't overcome by doctrine. Okay, a couple more things I want to say. Um, whoever denies me before men, God said, I will deny you before the Father. That sounds serious. It says, if we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. In other words, that means suffering, actually talking to strangers. And uh, if we don't deny him. Denying him was public. Peter was public. He just denied him in public. He didn't say anything. Peter didn't say anything. I don't know him. He didn't testify. Are you with me? Yeah. The Philadelphia church, they knew his name, and they took him public. They had a public witness. That was the unique thing about them. All right, so we overcome by what? Blood of the Lamb. It's the blood that washes us. You know, we just start there. That's always it, isn't it? Amen. The second one is the word of our testimony. How do we overcome the fear of evangelism? With our testimony. How do we overcome the fear of going out and evangelizing? Testimony. How are you going to overcome the fear of evangelism? Develop your testimony. I don't, I don't know if you heard me yet. I want to say it one more time. Are you okay? Yeah. How do I overcome the devil and the fear of not talking to strangers and evangelizing? By developing my testimony. Yes, sir. And that's not that hard. I just have to write down in a clear sentence or two about what God's done in my life. And I do what with that? I overcome the devil. Isn't that powerful? And then the third one is, oh, and a testimony. There's three levels of testimony. I mentioned it. 
there's the New Testament, New Testimony. But most have heard this one, so that's not that powerful. It's good. Are you with me? I mean, you can read a verse here. It's going to be good. I mean, the word is always good. But people have already heard this, so it's not super effective. The second level of testimony is someone else's testimony. I mean, I was at church, and Nate's thumb got instantly healed, and he went from a, I don't care about church, and running from church to church, to a cameraman, and a bass guitar player, and a website tech, and guru, and cook. His life changed because he got healed. As somebody, you, you can use that testimony. You can tell somebody else about yes, that. Sir. Amen. There was a girl here that got out of a wheelchair. And she's got clients listening and asking for prayer. Why? Because she believes prayer works. You can tell somebody else's testimony. Well, I never got out of a wheelchair. Well, you, you know of somebody that did. So you can use that testimony. But see, other people will think, well, that's just hearsay. I don't know who's that person. Who's to say that really happened? But here's the most powerful thing is your testimony. Because nobody can argue with your testimony because they'll know whether it's real or not. And then the third one is what? Uh, not loving our lives even if it kills us. Uh, in other words, not fearing evangelism even if I go out there and it kills me. I'm just going to do it. So you've got to overcome. So who wants to, uh, who wants to overcome this? How many knows the three steps to do it? Any caveman can do it, right? A caveman with, I can't do it, to, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. It's his blood that forgives me and cleanses me. I got a fresh start. I can start today. Everybody say, I can fresh start. Start today. I, I am failure free at this moment. Now what do I got to do? I got to get my testimony. Just get that 10-second testimony. Fine-tune it. Look in the mirror and see if you can get that person excited. Amen. And then uh, the third one. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid anymore. Because I can do everything the Bible says I can do. Did you get anything out of this today? Whew. I think I got through all of the notes in this teaching session. Now, if I was just evangelizing, see, I'd just come up here maybe at the beginning of the service, give you a 10-second testimony, a word of knowledge, and have an altar call. How many knows that would be like an evangelistic meeting? Right. I wouldn't teach on healing. I'd just give a word of knowledge, and people would respond, and they'd get healed. Yes, sir. yes? You see the difference? How many is able to separate that difference? For those of you, we're just going to worship right now. I'm not going to give an altar call. You know what the altar call is. Um, I've put together a evangelism program system as simple as one, two, three. Everybody say one, one two, two, three. And uh, that's going to start in 15 minutes or so back in the conference room if you'd like to stay. And I'm just going to give you some tools, et cetera, for that if you're interested. Amen? Amen. But other than that, how many is ready to just do the work of an evangelist? Amen. All right. A course, and then... Uh...